make copies of it, hand them out, because we really need to get the word out about that particular um, particular menace is what it is. Uh, when I say readable from 20 feet away, I also want to clarify that anybody could do it. Not just a federal agent with some fancy decryption. They're not encrypted and there's no protection. So anybody, a Walmart worker at a warehouse, could grab the reader device that they used to scan the inventory and walk through an event like this and capture all of those unique ID numbers that are very useful for tracking and stalking purposes. All right, so that's kind of the sort of the downside. There's kind of a cloud. You see the cloud on the horizon. We see this a lot in New Hampshire, especially this summer, where the big black cloud is kind of coming in. And that, I would say, is the big black cloud right now uh, at this point, August 2008, in the RFID arena. Now let me point in the other direction and look at the sunshine and the rainbow and tell you a little bit of good news to cheer you up on RFID. This time last year, when I spoke at this event, my biggest concern at that point was the RFID microchip implants, the VeraChip. Uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with the VeraChip implant. Okay, pretty much everybody in the crowd. This is the version of RFID with a microchip and an antenna that can be injected into human flesh. And it wasn't that long ago that I flew down to Florida to head up a protest and a prayer vigil outside of an Alzheimer's community center where they were implanting elderly people with this device uh, against their will, or, or at least without their express consent, because they were not uh, able to really even understand the procedure that was being done to them. Some very disturbing footage on Good Morning America showing some older people clearly with dementia, clearly not understanding that they were being used as guinea pigs as part of what even Verichip acknowledged was an experiment, a medical experiment, to see uh, how these things would work as uh, a way to manage their electronic medical records. So I devoted uh, the last year, probably year and a half of my life, to really focusing on that issue of microchip implants in an effort to get the word out about some research that had come out over the last probably 15 years. 11 different studies published in major medical journals linked to those microchips with fast-growing malignant cancers in laboratory uh, mice and rats. So you put one of these things into a mouse or a rat, even if they're not part of any other study, even in the control group where they didn't administer any compounds to them, they put them into the mice and rats, and in some cases the tumors they developed were bigger than the mice themselves. These things would grow to such an extent that they would kill the animals, in some cases within a matter of weeks. Now, when we looked into this research, I said, how can it be possible that they approved in 2005 that the FDA approved this Verichip implant for use in human beings if it so clearly has been shown to cause deadly metastatic, meaning it spreads throughout the body, cancer in these animals? And I worked very closely with uh, Todd Lewin from the Associated Press. We were able to get a hold of all of these documents, very obscure, published in pathology journals that really nobody reads. And he did the investigation. He followed up with the researchers. He talked to pathologists, uh, uh, oncologists, specialists at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center and elsewhere. And they all said, this is serious stuff, and we should halt the use of these microchip implants. All right, long story short, last September, just a month after I last stood on this stage, that story hit the, uh, hit the wires and what exploded. It, it, it appeared in over 2,000 different publications, that Associated Press article, repeated all over the internet. And uh, the very good news is right before his article came out, the Verichip stock was trading at uh, a, just under $11 a share. After the story came out, I would log on, it was kind of my fun for the day, and I would watch their stock value, just like in the cartoons, go down and down and down, then do a little tiny dip and go down and down and down. And uh, at last count, they were trading at just over a dollar. These guys are almost on the pink sheets now. Great news. Not only that, it gets even better. So they went from predicting at one point that they would have a market of billions of people worldwide that would be implanted with their products. And you may laugh, and at this point we can laugh, but I gotta point out that China just issued a billion RFID chips to its citizens in a mandatory national ID card that they're all required to carry to make them remotely scannable by the communist government. So it wasn't that far-fetched for Verichip to say, we want to have billions of these out there, and we're all going to be incredibly rich, so invest in our company. Well, I'll tell you, for a company that thought it was going to be making billions of dollars, guess what they earned in the first quarter of 2008, 11? Total, $3,000. <laughs>
$3,000 total from their chipping operations, and we understand that that was actually for maintaining the records of the Alzheimer's patients who had already been chipped. I know of at least uh, one person, and I believe now multiple people, who have had their microchip implants removed out of here for the cancer. So let's score one for victory, and uh, I, I, I just want to let you know that that fear, I think at least for the time being, has been allayed. So good news. It's always fun. speak about Real ID and give you a sense of what's happening in the upcoming legislative season. Joel and I have been working together uh, on the issue of RFID labeling legislation. We really need your help. And the reason this is so important is because uh, I, I was just down at the Fashion Institute of Technology in Manhattan two weeks ago. And the reason I went was because they hold an annual event called RFID in Fashion. And these guys this year scared the bejeebers out of me. They've got some of the biggest clothing companies in the world on board with this notion of beginning to put individual RFID tags into our clothing. If they do that, then there won't be any need to put it in your driver's license. They can just scan you and know who you are based on your shoes or your shirt or your underwear. So that's a very, very serious concern. The biggest problem I have with that, the companies that want to do it are anti-theft companies who specialize in hiding the devices into clothing and shoes. They're the ones who sandwich it between the layers of the soles of your shoe. They're the ones who sew it into the label or sew it into the seam or sew it behind a button or insert it into a button. That's what they specialize in doing and those are the people pushing this. And they're not small companies, they're huge. One of them is uh, ADT, Tyco. Tyco, one of the biggest corporations on the globe, uh, ADT, who make the uh, security devices in your homes, the alarm systems, they're pushing this to stores, and they've got contracts with literally thousands of stores across the country. So this is the menace that we face right now in New Hampshire, sort of our storm clouds. On the government side, we got to make sure that this state never agrees to offer these remotely readable ID cards. And on the consumer privacy front, we've got to make sure that this state, even if it has to be the first, uh, puts out a law that says they've got to tell you where the tags are. Now, as a good libertarian, I know I'm, I'm not a big fan of laws. Uh, Joel can tell you I, I'm not normally supporting laws. But this law, I think, is crucial because to put a tracking device in your shoe and to use it to track you around and not to tell you that it is there is a form of fraud, and that should be illegal. I, I believe very, very strongly. Their, their rights, uh, what, what is the old libertarian uh, uh, phrase? Your right to swing your arm ends where my nose begins. Well, their right to track the product ends where my purchase begins. And they need to at least let me know it's there so I can exercise that right to turn off the tracking if I choose to. So those are the big issues I would urge you. Get in touch with Joel. He's doing fantastic work up there in the State House. It's an honor and a pleasure to be working with him. Uh, we are going to be meeting in a couple of weeks back at the RFID Commission in Concord to urge and push for uh, labeling legislation and introduce some language for that. If you'd like to join us, we'd love to have you up there. It's going to be on September 12th, and I think it's at uh, 10 a.m., if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in the Legislative Office building, we can give you more details. My email address, kma at spychips.com. All right, thanks for listening. Uh, and thanks for coming out today. I, I, I love seeing you guys. Hey, welcome back. Here we are in Jeffrey, New Hampshire with Dr. Catherine Albrecht. Hello, Catherine. Hey, it's good to talk to you. What brought you here to Jeffrey, New Hampshire on this day with these people? Well, freedom, obviously. I, th I think it's a message that's going to start ringing out throughout this country. We are standing, I believe, on the cusp of a revolution where people are beginning to realize in large numbers that uh, the way... The way this country's going with corporations poking their noses in our business and especially with Big Brother government beginning to uh, peer over our shoulders at every turn, I think people are getting a little restless, a little bit uneasy, and I think it's time that we take this country back. I'm glad that you think the people have that much awareness. I've got a, um, a thought that sometimes the conditioning that they've received is so great that a large percentage of them don't have that awareness. But what I see here is a, um, I want to say, a, um, almost like the, the starting, the kindling, the sparking of that awareness. Um, I've seen it more as the years progress recently, um, but that's good that you see it that way. Well, it used to be, you know, the tiny percentage of people who spent their time reading political history or, you know, focused on the political process or, or philosophy or what have you. And now I think it's really spreading down to where it's, it's affecting regular people. You know, they see the value of, of their dollar going down, they see the prices going up. 
they see the volatility in the gold market, they see what's happening with their, with their gas prices, if nothing else. And on top of that, you know, you can't even open the newspaper today or turn on the television without hearing about some other big brother intrusion from some sector. And so I think, you know, now it's not just that small, tiny elite of people spending their time studying these issues. Now I think it's really becoming the mainstream hey, to say, yeah, we're, we're losing our freedoms in this country.